Today, we're going to be speaking with David Lester, co-founder of the exciting health drink brand Olipop. Before starting his own drinks brand, David worked in global brand marketing and innovation roles for almost a decade, working with iconic brands such as Smirnoff, Gordon's Gin, and Johnny Walker. David, so great to see you. Thanks so much for joining today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I've been really excited for this one. We, we've spoken to a lot of CMOs of major brands and people from media companies, but being an entrepreneur myself, I love hearing about the entrepreneurial journey, which you are very much in right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm excited to talk about all things Alipop. But before we dive in, would love to hear about the earlier stages of your career working at Diageo uh, for a decade, which is no short amount of time in someone's yeah. career. Um, what were some of the learnings you got? Because Diageo is obviously a market leader um, mm -hmm. in the spirits category. So I'm sure there was no shortage of um, lessons you had there. What were some of the ones that I guess are top of mind for you? I mean, it was a great experience. When I started at Diageo in the early 2000s, I think it was, they had um, a program called Diageo Way of Brand Building or Dweeb, as they called it. And so I came in as a as grad student, I didn't know anything about, you know, marketing or, or frank business in general. Why did you take the job? Um, it's a good question. <laughs> I, think yeah. I came out of college and I wasn't, you know, I applied for a range of different stuff. Actually, I think I was applying, I remember applying for like accounting jobs. I don't, I don't know why I right. did that. I would have been awful at that. Um, <laughs> something about marketing seemed interesting to me. And I think I, I, you know, I grew up in the northwest of England, just outside of Liverpool. And, you know, if you're familiar with England at all, there's basically London and then there's everywhere else. Yeah. So growing up, you know, my, my mom was a school teacher. My dad worked in a government job, local council, managing the parks and open spaces. My fr friend's parents were kind of nurses and firemen and things like that. So um, it was all very new to me, this idea of going to London and, and working in a in a corporation. Um Marketing sounded interesting because it's kind of, you had to understand about people and I'm kind of aesthetic and I, you know, was interested in brands to a degree. And so it was a bit of a leap. Um, you know, we, there was actually a, a graduate program that I got accepted onto, which I think there was like 8,000 applicants and they picked two of us. Um, so it's one of those kind of sliding doors moments. You think if I redid that scenario a hundred times, it probably wouldn't have worked out right. for me. So you know, I'm very grateful for that. And as I say, they, they put me on this, um, Diageo Way of Brand Building course. There was two week long sessions where we got to, uh, learn marketing from some of the leading marketers at Diageo. It was like something they really invested in, went to a fancy hotel and got these presentations on the history of brands and how Diageo wanted to do brand marketing. And that was fascinating to me. Um, and then I had the chance to go and apply it to brands like Gordon's and Smirnoff. Um, so about half of my career was brand marketing. I, I led the Johnny Walker brand in Australia for a while. It's the third largest uh, market globally for that. Um, you know, I learned a lot about mass brands, which I think is interesting now on, on Olipop because um, there is a big difference between niche marketing and, and mass marketing. Sure. And, um, you know, we started on Instagram, like a lot of brands do, and a little bit sort of trendier LA type wellness vibe to what we were doing. Um, and we've rapidly evolved into a more mass market brand. Um, and, um, you know, it, you learn some discipline working on Smurnoff and Johnny Walker as, you know, you can't do niche marketing on those right. brands. Yeah. Also probably had to appease the retailers and learn about distribution, which I'm sure is a big part of the work stream at Diageo. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly interesting learning how a big company like that works yeah. and, it, and it's very well functioning company as well. So, of course. um, you know, the other half of my career at Diageo was product innovation. So that's sort of launching new products. We ran a navigate process, same as a lot of large companies do. So you basically have to take your business plan to an executive team and they kick it to pieces, um, which again, is quite for, helpful. For new brands or, or new flavors or extensions. That's right, yeah. line extensions innovation. or new to world right. innovation. Um, so, you know, have you scoped the size of market properly? Is this scalable? Is it profitable? Um, can we manufacture it through our system? Um, and most of that failed, um, but there's only so many ways that a, um, you know, a consumer goods product can fail. You know, you tend to find the the mistakes repeat themselves. There's odd little lessons that you learn as well, just from experience. Like, you know, I remember um, 
just maybe a whiskey product we were working on where we had this amazing bottle for as credible look super premium research really well didn't really sell that much in the market what we discovered was actually too premium people didn't ever want to pick it up and drink it because it was for a special occasion that never arrived right um so it's that sort of stuff that you learn just from you like get those aha moments from launching things and seeing how they work or don't work um that has been extremely helpful yeah it sounds like it was almost awesome. like a second university for you in many Absolutely. ways you learn about brand marketing you learn about product development and there's bas that's basically what you need to know to launch your own drink brand right a certain side of it the yeah. bit i didn't learn was entrepreneurialism which yeah. is well we'll get into that which is a huge part of it but um but yeah in terms of some of the kind of base skills um and you know how to make something amazing and i've got a great business partner who's a credible formulator as well um you know yeah that, that kind of came together quite quite well yeah so and you left after 10 years in 2013 but you didn't launch um your current brand Alipop until 2018 so it was five years in between mm -hmm. what precipitated your decision to leave Diageo and then I imagine that's when your entrepreneurial journey started so walk us through you know that journey to get you to launching the brand in 2018. yeah um I mean so it was a great experience at Diageo fantastic company um yeah, I, I think there was two reasons really to leaving. One was um, yeah, I experienced a lot of my leadership lessons were from my mom growing up as, as a school teacher. Um, I saw the impact that she had on people's lives. You know, kids would go back and visit her ten years after leaving the school, yeah. um, and it'd been really fun this journey with Diageo. And you know, I'd got the chance to travel to Australia and to Brazil to live and work in those places, which I was very grateful for. But as I looked at the next 10 years of my life, I was like, I don't think I want to be saying alcohol for another 10 years. Um, and, um, you know, I was getting a little sort of grumpy with the bureaucracy of a large corporation. Sure. Um, I think like a lot of entrepreneurs, um, you know, I was probably more immature at that, that time in my life as well. and wasn't managing the bureaucracy very well and just had a sort of defiant personality really. Um, and so, you know, didn't love being told what to do by other people, <laughs> you know, all those things that kind of lead you to, to doing something kind of crazy in starting your own, own business. So I actually, my wife and I were moving from Brazil to the U S at that time, we we're about to get married. And I told my boss I was leaving and she said, well, if your mind's made up and you definitely want to leave, you might want to speak to this guy. He's looking for a business partner that turned out to be Ben, um, who, I'm in business with now. Wow. And so I met him at a coffee shop in Palo Alto. He had a little bag of sodas. He'd made in soda stream bottles. And um he's a fascinating guy. <laughs> you know, he was a sort of guy that wakes up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat wondering what the meaning of life is and had a real purpose about what he was doing. Super intelligent guy, had an intensity. Um, you know, I also love adventure, so it seemed like an adventure to me, this. Um and so we, we kind of started out and we had a had an initial uh venture product called obi which was very similar healthy soda made with a water kefir base um and, and we, what was the insight behind a healthy soda just because there's demand for soda but it's not healthy and there must be a healthy yeah. form basically is that the well i mean ben is really the patient zero for it um <laughs> you know his background is he grew up in quite a you know a poor family in monterey south of san francisco um had quite a challenging childhood he talks about it a little bit on podcasts that he's done um and he was overweight and he was eating the standard american diet like a lot right. of people are um and he just kind of realized about age 14 he was like this isn't going to work out very well and i need to make a change and he did and he got a job and started buying better food and he lost weight um but he also saw that his mental clarity improved uh, which he wasn't expecting. And um, he became very interested in the gut brain connection. He dropped out of college. He taught himself microbiology. Wow. Um, he had a mentor at a time who was a um, civil rights activist, won a Supreme Court case by himself, this guy, <laughs> studying in the library. So he was in a very entrepreneurial world and, um, you know, really wanted to, was frustrated by the food that was available. Um, you know, he grew up. Uh, eating, you know, stuff that 
he was like, this is delicious. Like, I get it. There's a lot, lot of empathy in what he was doing. You know, he was like, I understand why people eat this stuff. It's right. delicious. It's cheap. It's sometimes all you have available. Um, but we got to do better than this because I've felt so much benefit from making a change in, in my diet. Um, and this was just his, his passion and his mission. Um, so I was kind of follower number one, basically, and in, in behind him on that. You know, I brought my technical skill, um, which was helpful on the first venture, but I just, I didn't know enough about being an entrepreneur and there was aspects we didn't know on capital raising and, you know. So, yeah. The, so what were some of those things when you say you didn't know enough about being an entrepreneur, what were the parts of being an entrepreneur that you didn't expect and kind of bit you when you went into this venture to begin with? Basically everything. Um, <laughs> you know, I think I hear people going from their corporate career to, yeah. um, you know, an entrepreneurial venture. I'm not sure what your experience has been like that with yourself, but you know, there's, you know, corporate career can give you good technical skills, but in terms of the mindset of an entrepreneur, it gives you nothing. Right. Um, so, um, you know, I, I've been fortunate not to have that much adversity in my life at that point. And then it hit me like a lot of it. We had two kids at the same time. Did you think about quitting at any point? Um, yeah, I mean, for sure. Like it was very painful. I was just like, make it stop. Especially with kids. Like a lot yeah. of people start businesses when they don't have a mortgage, they don't have a family. So they don't have a safety net, but the, you know, they're not going to far too, uh, fall down, you know, uh, yeah. yeah, fall too far down, you know, because you don't have that much to lose. But once you have a family and once you have responsibilities, it changes the stakes dramatically. Yeah, it's it's wild, and they're very demanding and emotionally demanding kids as well. You yeah, know, you have to have emotional energy for them. Oh yeah, right. Can't just be present. Yeah. So, and yeah, you know, entrepreneurship. I think you know I, I've learned to manage it a lot better now. I think some of the big things is like giving up the idea of control. It's like there's a lot of stuff I don't have control over. Right. So I'm gonna not not stick my head in the sand. Have I'll, some faith in whatever leap you're taking, and let the chips fall where they may. To a degree, yeah. yeah. And just know that. I think frustration comes from the sort of gap between reality and expectation. So my expectation now is like, everything's going to be a mess, uh, which is generally the case. So when you're trying to do your own thing, um, yeah, all kinds of random stuff is going to hit you. You're like, really, is that what's happening today? Okay, fine. That's, you know, it's going to happen. And then what you have a choice around is your reaction to that. Um, and maybe something comes along one day that you can't overcome and that's, you know, and that's that. And so, um, but I, I think for me, like I've enjoyed this journey up to now, I would never regret doing like the, you know, this, this venture, regardless of where it ends up. Um, I've, it's given me so much. Um, so you kind of at peace with that to a degree. Um, I think a huge thing for me was ego. Um, you know, I grew up with a a reasonable amount of privilege in terms of you know I had food on the table when i grew up i had you know money enough money to do the things i need to do very supportive parents you know went to a nice college got a good job um and you know brief set a brief sense of entitlement things are going to work out for me yeah and you realize as an entrepreneur you're not entitled to anything <laughs> you know you're only entitled to what you work for and even then you maybe don't get it either you right. can you know, timing could be wrong. Something could go wrong. Exactly. Like supply chain. Something yeah. is completely not your fault. And, and it doesn't matter. And right. It doesn't matter. You're it's right. always your fault when you're running the business. Well, I think that's a great point. It's, yeah. all, it's always, well, what I say is, you know, accountability is self empowerment, as I see it anyway. Um, I mean, it's exactly what you just said. I realized anything that I was blaming somebody else for, I immediately just gave up control. Well, you can't control that, right? Because it's someone else's fault. So there's nothing you can do about it that's kind of nerve wracking as an yeah. entrepreneur, because, you know, the more stuff that you don't have control over, then the more powerless you feel. So I just learned the discipline of, and it's very binary, isn't it? Starts up, you either have a business or you don't have a business. You know, when I was launching products at Diageo, some of them didn't work out and they were like, well, you did a great job on the, you know, on the launch and it didn't work out and that's fine. And here's another one and we'll go again, you know, you don't get that opportunity when it's your own business. Of course. It's, so it's yeah, strong. you kind of have to make it work if you're, as the more you invest into it. So 
you did launch Olipop in 2018. You were here in 2023. Mm -hmm. We're each drinking a can of a, a beautiful designed Olipop. And I mentioned <laughs> to you before the podcast that I grab one almost every morning from my local coffee shop. So this is a business, right? Mm -hmm. You have crossed at least some chasm where you put something out into the world that people are adopting. How did you get from where we are today to just starting? Like, tell us the story of Olipop when it launched in, in 2018. Um, there is no clean way to start. I think okay. as though with these things, it's like, well, how do you invent the product? Like, how do you, how do you make a soda? Talk to me about that yeah. because I, I don't even have the first idea If someone says launch a soda brand. What do you do? You just buy different ingredients and tinker with it and come up with something that tastes good. Is, is that it's simple? Pretty much it. It's pretty much it. Right. So Ben is a product formulator. So he, yeah, put the flavors together. In a lab. He like went into a lab and yeah, I mean, in his kitchen his right? lab so, is his kitchen yeah and did you kitchen. come every day and say mm, this tastes good this doesn't taste good did you bring in other people to try it early on yeah so there's certain things i mean we rely on ben's palate so he has clear vision he had a vision for the, the ingredients that he wanted to put into this he had a vision for how he wanted it to taste he has a great palate so like we're sort of relying on him putting that together um you know we had packaging design and stuff and i i actually ran consumer groups myself how'd you come up with the name uh I just thought of it one day. It's basically comes from oligosaccharides, which is a technical name for prebiotic fibers and pop. And uh, naming is the most difficult part of product innovation. Yeah, uh, for anybody that's done it. Um, so it was something, especially consumer products. It totally, yeah. you know, most of the names are taken, and so you want something that's distinct. Um, and everything sounds stupid when you first like imagine of Apple or Yahoo, Google, or Google, all those yeah, names. They sound Sushi, stupid yeah, it until does, you have to build a story behind it. And then yeah, it doesn't exactly. sound stupid. Yeah, you're, you're like, like that's, yeah. that's somebody's name. Yeah. It doesn't sound right. You know, but you know, icons become icons because we imbue them with meaning um over time. Um so exactly. you, can't, you can't fast track that. Hey silly. So we certainly wanted something that sounded like a soda brand. It was kind of had a certain Anamatapeo about it. It rolled off the tongue, it was distinctive and unique. And I was like, look, I don't know. I still had a lot of doubt around the name Olipop. It sounded a bit weird to me, but I was like, I think this has got enough of the characteristics of a good name to stick with it. Um, so we did. Um, but yeah, you're right. And then you've got to figure out where you're going to manufacture it. And then you got to figure out a distributor and then you got to sell into retail. It's just, that's the process. So like, what was the biggest, I, I so it sounds like you deal with more of the business side. You dealt with more of the, the, the packaging and the, and the branding and he dealt with the actual product. And we, of, we kind of backwards and forwards on a lot uh, of stuff to be it. honest. So, yeah. And then you had, I guess, a, an MVP, a minimally viable product. Yep. And then I guess the next step is to get retail adoption, right? So did you just go door to door to different retailers and say, will you sell this? How did that? come to life yeah kind of so we did raise money initially throughout the gate so we raised half a million dollars in a, in a convertible note was that challenging to do yeah well we had to do it off a powerpoint day basically because right. you don't have anything at that stage of so you're selling off vision um it's the most difficult check did people raised. taste the product they could taste it right. so we could make bench samples but it hadn't gone into production. So, you know, some investor would be like, well, okay, this tastes good, but I can you yeah, scale it? Yeah, you just made it in the kitchen. How do I know it's going to taste exactly. well? Exactly, like right. when it goes into a manufacturing plant. Um, so I think at that point, there is no logic to investing in a company yeah. like that. So, you know, I, I say this to entrepreneurs all the time that are trying to get investment at early stage. I'm like, look, if they start asking you for model for models and like it's all bullshit of and, course you know the more you try and apply logic to it the more you would talk yourself out of it because it sounds crazy <laughs> you know what i mean it so true. sounds so crazy yeah. so mate you just have to find just one person that believes in you and what you're doing 100 and the vision that you're painting and that's it and that's all you're going to get and, and that's all you need so you know our guy was uh a guy called pat finn he actually was our first investor on obi as well interestingly our first venture so invested in that one and then he still he must have really believed in you guys he still believed yeah. the same second one like um you know with sort of 10 years in this guy hasn't made you know any money out of us uh -huh. yet <laughs> and uh you know but he's really kind of stuck with it he saw what we were trying to do he believed in ben and i as well he was like these guys are gonna do something cool um and you know he went off i think the best early stage investors do go off their gut instinct a bit 
So you can't, they have no, to, there's no logic at that point. You know, I don't know how they do it, to be honest. I wouldn't invest in it. Well, anything, some, so. I think early stage investors say, oh, they worked at Google or Facebook. So they must be good. I'm going to invest in them. And they just build yeah. the person's resume, which That's true. I would imagine your background, Diageo had something to do with it, but it's a little bit different in the consumer product space and is in technology. So yes, it is a big, you know, yep. leap in faith. And Ben and I had no connect. I just arrived in the States, right? you know, uh, Ben didn't complete college, you know, we were not a very investable team in that respect, you know? So, um, so we got that and we knew we were like, just need to make this thing. And then people are going to really see. So, that's, that's, that's so you took the half million, you said, we're going to make it. And you say you found that the partners and manufacturers to come up with essentially the product in the can and you had case X amount of cases of it at the end. That's right. And then, you know, we're sort of selling in. So we started in about 40 independent stores in Northern California. How? Um, door to door, so, like you just call them and say, will you sell our product? Like, yeah, is it on consignment? How does it work? Yeah. It's a very tricky, like kind of cash 22 in, in food and Bev starter, because you go to the distributor, which you need to like deliver your product. Right. And be like, Hey, got this great product. Will you take us on? And they'll be like, do you have any stores? And we're like, not yet, but right. if you take us on, we can get some stores. And they're yeah. like, well, come back to this when you've got some stores. Right. So you then go to the stores and you're like, Hey, we've got this great product. Would you like stock it? And they're like, yeah, who's your distributor? And they're like, <laughs> we don't have one yet. And they're like, we'll come back to this when you've got a distributor. So you had to do this kind of sleight of hand where you sell into a couple and then we had to get the distributor over the line. So it was a, actually a dairy distributor called dairy delivery was our first distributor in Northern California. And that gave us this kind of base of 40 stores to get started with. Um, Erewhon in LA was one of our yeah. first stores. Um, so once you're in those stores, you're just praying that people are going to buy it and like it. Like, is there anything else you can do at that point after you're in those 40 doors? Not a lot. I mean, you have to make sure you're visible on the shelf, right? That the product's available. How do you do that? You just go, do you go you visit the stores and make sure yeah. it's merchandise well as yourself? It's pretty much. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, that's it. You just get in there and move the shelf around and you know, and maybe do some sampling. And right. Because for all you know, some, some competitive products would be pushing yours like to the back of the shelf or it doesn't look as good. Exactly. And now all that matters. Yeah. And if you've got three facings or eight facings, it's going to matter as well. Right. The amount of cans um, people see on the shelf. Yep. It's just, right. You know, it's Inventory. All, right. It's about visibility yeah. in, in stores. So, um, but you, you, you'll find out pretty quick if you've got something or you don't have. So something. how quick did you find out? It's pretty quick. Yeah. It just, I mean, it's been a rocket since then, essentially. So those stores. Do you know why? Like, in other words, like, so it took off right away. Were you able to talk to the consumers that liked it and they gave you feedback? Did certain flavors take off faster than others? How did you start to get that feedback loop to build from there? Yeah, we. I mean, we had a hypothesis around, I mean, say Ben was trying to solve for a real problem, you know? And so that was our hypothesis. Like, right. we're trying to solve for an actual problem here. Um, and you know, people were like, yeah, you're right. We love soda, um, but it's too much sugar in it. And, you know, so if you can give me something that essentially tastes good, you know, it tastes like cream soda. Um, yeah, I'm in, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, um, so that, that's essentially what happened. You know, people love you're testing everything for product market fit at that point, the packaging name, refining liquid you have out there. Um, yeah. And, um, so the, the couple of lessons we had early were this one, the, uh, vintage cola actually started out as cinnamon cola and it was in kind of like a brown can. Um, and we found that consumers, cause we wanted to give it like a healthy twist on it. Um, and we found consumers like, hold on, cinnamon is that like spicy? And right. we were like, no, cinnamon is just an ingredient. But you're almost color. changing consumer behavior because when they buy traditional soda, they don't think of cinnamon. You're right. Right. You're right. And so we changed the can to red and white and vintage cola. So the other one, you know, we started with cinnamon cola, strawberry vanilla, and ginger lemon. The ginger lemon was designed as a sort of kombucha style uh -huh. product. Um, and because we weren't sure if like the sweet flavor is going to sell that well in the natural channel where we're right. starting out. Right. Um, like a soda, a dirty word in a natural channel. So they're exactly. going to go more to the kombucha. Yeah. 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 Um, and, but as it turns out, like, I think this is the case even to today, you know, in an Uber health store in LA, like Erewhon, like that's the health store of all health stores. Uh -huh. Their top selling beverage skew outside of water is strawberry vanilla olipop. 
Now, I don't actually drink that flavor because I find it a bit too sweet. I love it. Um, <laughs> and we found that just like everybody loves soda. Yeah. You know, that that's the thing. It's like, it's, it's I mean, it has 97. There's a reason why the Titans in the space are some of the, you know, most prolific companies in the world. It's true. Right? Like it has 97% household penetration. So um, we found now that ginger lemon is one of our slowest moving SKUs because it's not actually designed on a soda profile. So much different category. It almost is. Yeah. It almost is. And so everything, that's why we, you know, we got the confidence to do things like cream soda. And, and th did you tweak the original uh, ingredients after that first round and when you went out there, or, or is it still the same original? It's still the same. That's fantastic. Right. Yeah. Yep. So you start to get some scale, you move beyond the four years. I imagine then you had to raise more money at that point um, to, to continue to scale, I guess, the inventory so you could distribute to more places. Constantly raising money. Right. Constantly raising money. But it yeah, got but you a little easier each time, I would imagine. It does. Um, yeah, nothing will be as hard as it says that right. first Because now you do brand. have a model, and then you do have numbers, and all of a sudden yeah. you do have a finished product to show people, and it just becomes more and exactly. more real along the way. Exactly. So then the, the next phase, how many doors did you guys go to? Did the, you know, and when did you finally get to more of the big box chains where you are today? Well, our revenue growth, so this is our fifth year in business. So it's gone 1 million first year, 9 million, 30 million. 75 million last year we'll do over 200 this year wow congratulations um, that's thanks. amazing it's been a trip it's very impressive. um but I'd say a lot of it is off the mistakes we made the first time around it always is we wouldn't have gone this fast if we did make all those mistakes so now when we get to that fork in the road we're like oh remember that one Dro drove us off the cliff last time let's go this way um so yeah, we, we launched nationally into Target and Walmart um, last year. We outsell a and in Target. We outsell Pepsi in Target at this point. Um, wow. And so, what was that like walking into a Target and seeing your products? I mean, it gives me chills just thinking about it from the journey you were on to seeing yeah. your product in Target. It's like you've made it at that point. I know you don't probably think you've made it because I can see it in your eyes. You have yeah. a lot more to do, but that's a big moment for somebody who does what you do. Yeah. Yeah. I think. It's I, this has been my experience of entrepreneurship. I don't know if it's other people's experience, but it's almost like saying to my wife the other night, you never really get the chance to properly celebrate something. Yeah, I know. Because it's so painful to achieve like a financing or something. It's like you think you got it and then it gets pulled away and then you have to hover it. Well, even after you raise the money, you have to deliver for the investors. So the work's really only just beginning, mm -hmm. right? There's never really a point where, and that's what makes entrepreneurs who they are is that you never take your foot off the gas. And that's why a lot of the incumbents in this space, you're able to catch up with it because they are taking their foot off the gas. They don't have people like you and me that are running it, that are sleeping with one eye open, always trying to drive <laughs> it, right? So then yeah. all of a sudden they just stop innovating and the world changes and and the consumer changes and all of a sudden you have an Olipop that's creeping up in, in the store yeah. shelves. Yeah, yeah, totally. So it's sometimes just feels like relief when you get to a point, yeah. you know, rather than the celebration. Yeah, well put. Um, but I, but I think I've got better, uh, put better boundaries in place. I think I'm calmer about this journey. Um, I you know, realize there's a lot of luck involved in how things unfold and, you know, societal measures of success. It's not a very good way to be measuring yourself. Um, you know, it's interesting at the beginning of this journey, nobody was particularly interested in what I was doing. I was not doing any podcasts or anything like that at that point, but what I was doing was very impressive. I was a failed entrepreneur that got back on my feet raised cash off a of PowerPoint deck, mm. which get a product to market. I was impressed with myself right. at that point. Um, For a lot of people, that's not enough. You know, and then you have, and that, what you see now is you have young kids, 18, 20 years old, that try to flex, like, and they spend all the little money they have on impressing people and posting stuff on Instagram and saying they're building a business, but they really built nothing. Mm -hmm. And then five, 10 years from now, they're still not really gonna have anything. And then you have people who went through your journey where all you really need is to be ex impressed by yourself. And yeah. that was enough for you to keep going. And I think that's really the dichotomy we see in this Instagram era where people aren't patient. They want it now and they want to have the optics of it now, but that's going to come in a lot of ways at you know the behest of their future success. It's true. And I've got a lot of empathy for people, like particularly you know, young people coming through today. Like social media is such it's a, so hard. Can, can be a very difficult yeah. driver. We both have um, children that they're facing it. And yeah, they'll continue to face it. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I'm very fortunate. I grew up in the northwest of England. You know, it's like, I mean, my summer job was like collecting the trash cans on the on the trucks. You yeah, know? like 
I have entrepreneurialism in my family. My, my grandfather, my family's originally from Scotland. My grandfather was an entrepreneur in Dundee on the East coast of Scotland. He had a trucking and sand dredging business. There's no venture capital involved in that one. Um, you know, his father passed away when he was 27. He had to run the whole thing. They lived in tenement housing, you know, and that was what allowed them to get out of that position and put my mom through college. So, you know, I actually have a picture of his truck on my, that's on my amazing. Wall. You know, when I'm having a tough day, I'm like, I yeah, think perspective, I think, right? I think it'd be all right. right I think it'd be right, all right. You know, right, so, right. Um, but it, but it's, it is hard. There's a lot of distractions out there in society. I've been fortunate to have really good people around me who've supported me, whether I've been successful or not. They're always proud of me. Yeah. You know, they were proud of me when I failed on my first venture. They were proud of me when I was getting back on my feet. They're proud of me now that I'm, you know, achieving something that has a bit more societal success factors attached to it. But of course, you know, from my point of view, that doesn't make any difference. Like I don't read anything more into that than I would do. So I'm probably more impressed with myself than what I did at the beginning of yeah. this than what I'm doing now. I mean, we have a lot of momentum. And you're able to provide for your family. And there are, you know, obviously benefits of commercial success that impact you personally, yeah. especially when you're, you yeah. have a family. You yeah, know? totally. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, some ways it gets easier. You know, we, I've got a lot of smart people working in our business yes. now. And, you know, we, we kind of accidentally over delivered our plan this year. We just sold way more than we thought. There's we not many to. people that are saying that in 2023. So no, yeah. in the first year, I mean, that million dollars, like we scrapped it out to get a yep. million dollars. Like now we're over delivering our plan by tens of millions of dollars, just sort of without even realizing it. So, um, you know, uh, yeah, some of those things get, get kind of easier to degree. For sure. Yeah. So 200 million this year, and I agree, like you can't just measure it by revenue, but just in terms of the brand awareness and the consumer impact, it's certainly real. W where do you go from here? W what are you focused on in 2024 and beyond in terms of continuing to build the business? There's still a lot for us to grow. Um, you know, we're only in 30,000 doors at this point. So there's, there's lots of areas we haven't touched. We're not in any convenience stores. We haven't really done much with club. Um, you know, we've only been in major retailers like target and Walmart, but meaning like Sam's club and right. Costco. Costco. So yeah. 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 Um, when you and, said club, I thought you meant on premise, like night right, establishments, which I would imagine that is also an opportunity for you. I'm more. sure it would be. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, we've only been in target and Walmart for a little over 12 months. So, so much opportunity to grow um and uh you know we're excited to take it on and say it's a real privilege to be able to to do this and to get to take on these challenges each day with a with an awesome group of people so yeah i really don't know where it will go and i i kind of like that you know <laughs> i didn't like when i was seeing my corporate career that i could see, i remember starting work in london and you know on that ladder and i was like i can see where this is going to go and i see where i'm going to end up and i, I that was not motivating or exciting to me yeah and so the fact I, if i look back at the last 10 years i'm like that was crazy but i would have no idea that i would have ended up in this place and For i sure. kind of like that idea looking forward to the next Made 10 life years exciting yeah it's been like i i have no idea yeah what this is gonna i love be that too about being an entrepreneur. So, you just don't know how the story's going to play out yeah and you have to if you look at that as like an adventure it makes yes. life all the more fun. Absolutely. Um, so we're here at the Brand Week conference in Miami, and obviously Brand Week's all about marketing and building a brand. Who is the Alipop consumer, whether it's by demographics or psychographics? How do you know who the right design target is for, for your product? Um, you know, soda is a very ubiquitous category. Um, I think the one, we have a term called happy seekers mm -hmm. for, our, for our consumers. Um, so really, if you're going to be interested in drinking Olipop, you have to care some aspect about your health. Sure. You know, so you have to care about sugar and or digestive health. Otherwise, you would just buy a can of Coke, right? right. It's, it's cheaper. It's a good, a good brand. It tastes good. It's more available. Yeah. Like, why would you buy Olipop? So, um, but what we're finding is that group of happy seekers is getting bigger and bigger. Especially post COVID. So true. Like pe yeah. now people are like, look, I don't, I don't want to necessarily have a kale juice every day but i am more conscious about i'm conscious of the food i'm eating is perhaps not not helping me i mean two-thirds of americans report digestive distress you know it's like we all know somebody that's like yeah i was chatting to a lady earlier today who's um whose sister uh is struggling with ms and so it's a bunch of stuff you can't consume right olipops you can't 
Um, and I love those stories because soda is fun. That's what it's about. It's fun. It's refreshing. Yeah. It's about memories. Um, our eldest son is uh, has quite severe ADHD and anxiety. We he's gluten free, dairy free. We have to control his diet quite a lot, um, and it makes a big difference to him. But you know, he wants to drink some sodas because his mates are drinking sodas. You know, I can make him a root beer float if I want with Ollie Pop and Oatly or ice cream or something. And, you know, not worry about the fact that he's m consuming 60 grams of sugar right. or whatever or dairy or... But at the same time, not necessarily missing out. Not missing out, exactly. And I think that's a key thing. It's like, and that's our approach. We're like, look, we don't want anybody to miss out. We get it. Um, and so just we'll take care of the... The complicated part in terms of making sure it's good for you and we do all our research we've done university standard research with Baylor and Purdue medical colleges everything else, you just enjoy the soda yeah you know and um you know just say one of the areas we start to move into is emotional brand positioning which is really important um if you're going to occupy that soda space so you know we've developed a brand territory of real love and we launched our first um iteration of that campaign with Camila Caballo earlier this year um, on, on our sort of first national TV ad, um, which performed really well. Yeah. So um, so that's been fun to sort of enter into that space as well. Yeah, for sure. So to wrap up, uh, David, I mean, it's a great story and inspiring, and I'm sure it'll be inspiring to our audience as well, just in terms of how this idea came to life and where it is now. And I can't wait to see where it goes. When you look back on your career, um, and you you think about the things and the decisions that you may write to put you in the position you are today. And if you had to bottle them up, what were some of the things that you think? Because right, luck happens to us, or bad yeah. things happen to us. But also, we, our decisions dictate a lot of that as well. What yeah. were some of those decisions that you can point to? Um, I mean, I think humility and vulnerability are two things that always give me a return. Yeah, on my entrepreneurial journey, and like, you come across that way. I can tell you. Um. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, it is humbling this experience. And if you try and wrestle with that too much, if you, if you can't get your ego out of the way, we're often tripping ourselves up. That's the problem. Right. And I realized on our first venture, I was doing that a lot of the time. There's a lot of people out there that are definitely smart enough to start their own business or, but maybe they're not humble enough. Maybe they're not willing to be vulnerable. Um, if you are, and there's a foundational to a growth mindset, I'm sure you've discovered yourself, most things you can figure out mm -hmm. or you'll attract somebody that is willing to help you out. <laughs> you know, um, you, you know, human nature is a uh, extremely fascinating and powerful thing. You know, groups of people gravitate where they see you authentically going after something with humility. It's incredible what um, support you'll get in doing it. Absolutely. We're going to leave it with that. Thank you so much for joining. It was a fantastic conversation. Again, I can't wait for our audience to hear it. So on behalf of Susie and Adam Keen, thanks again to David Lester, co-founder of Olipop for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review to Speed the Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Until next time, see you soon, everyone. Take care. Speed of Culture is brought to you by Susie as part of the Adweek Podcast Network and A-Guest Creator Network. You can listen, subscribe to all Adweek's podcasts by visiting adweek.com slash podcasts. To find out more about Susie, head to suzy.com. And make sure to search for the Speed of Culture in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Click follow so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Susie, thanks for listening.